one thing that I wanted to say before we start on the formal presentation is this came out, Carol did tell you, it came out of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Landmarks Law. But since uh, we are both involved with the New York School of Interior Design, uh, when Kate was invited to be on the committee <coughs> planning activities for the anniversary, she came to us at NICE and said, you know, well, this would be an interesting thing for us to be involved in. So Kate and I and Hugh Hardy and an interior designer named, um, and then Kitty Hawks, who has been very active in Municipal Art Society, were the curatorial committee for an exhibition at the New York School of Interior Design. We could only include, was it 20, 20 or one? Something like that. The school has a relatively small gallery, but we did an exhibition last spring on interiors and as that was being planned, realized that there wasn't a book about landmark interiors, which is why we went to work on this book. So anyway, that's, that's what brought it about. We only, we don't really have half of them. We have 47 out of 170. But uh, civic structures, so a lot of things. But um, the, the first, it's interesting that if you look back at the history of designation, the first interiors that were designated after 1973 were the ones that were incontrovert in incontrovertibly public. So the New York Public Library was the first interior landmark, although interestingly not the main reading room. It is still not protected as a landmark, but the main hall and, and certain other rooms are. So that was the first, but obviously a public <coughs> space. The Metropolitan Museum, Historic House Museums, uh, things start to get interesting um, when you get into commercial buildings. So again, office buildings, theaters, restaurants, all of that. So I should hand things over to Judith to talk okay, to you about so the Chrysler building. Well, before that, I would like to put in one, one point. What's so difficult about interiors? The explanation of why are there only 117? It's <coughs> not just the fact that the exterior is a more obvious place in a building. People don't notice the interiors as much, but inherently, by their very nature, interiors are fragile. You walk on the floor, I mean, this floor is not a problem. You walk on the carpet, you sit on the upholstery, you put your hand on the walls, um, the light bulbs wear out, and maybe different types of lighting are developed, different materials are developed, there are finishes that are no longer safe to manufacture that are environmentally unsound. So an interior just in the normal use of it, day to day, is going to be changed. So it's a problem, the challenge of protecting it while allowing for the reasonable amount of change has been a difficult situation. Uh, the fact that very <coughs> often the owner is wary of allowing something to be landmark because it's going to restrict what he does with his space. And sometimes, it's, most of the time, in these cases, it's a space in which he, with which he makes money. So we have to balance, not we, but the Landmarks Commission, <coughs> has to balance the permission for the, the maintenance of buildings with the growth, which is a natural part of the city. And to go on with, we arrange these with one exception in order of when they were designated. And of course, an early designation. And I'm showing you an older image which shows you how the building was initially not drowned by everything around it. Um, the interior of this, well, the building itself, I don't know how many of you know the Chrysler building history. Walter Chrysler paid for it out of his own pocket. It was time that he wanted to, he wanted to make a statement, not personally so much as but the company had his name, for the Chrysler Corporation. And this was a building that started to be built when he took it over and hired a new architect and wanted a monument to the automobile, which it became so that a lot of the exterior ornaments, which I'm not going to show you in this because that's not really what we're talking about, but they were inspired by things like radiator caps and what do you call the running, thing? On? Running boards. No, on the front of the, uh, thank you, the grill and the motifs. So all of this was taken from automobile. Inside, we have a magnificent lobby, which has 
three murals by, and I don't always remember, Edmund Tr uh, Edward Trumbull. One was on energy, one was on the building itself, and over the Lexington Avenue entrance is an image of the building, and the third mural they joined together in the center was the history of transportation. Uh, it became different owners took it over, the building deteriorated, it was, you know, 42nd Street is not the most prestigious place to have an office anymore, but under the new owners, it was cleaned up, restored, so that now you can see the, uh, the, the ceiling. You always could see, or here you could see some of the mural, you can see the wayfinding, which is the marble floor, so that people can find their way in a very large lobby, which is now open, but originally had automobiles in it on display. And one of the most dramatic attractions here are the absolutely incredible uh, elevator uh, with mosaics, uh, <coughs> mosaics, uh, with marquetry of many different kinds of wood. Unfortunately, uh, and you're gonna see this in a couple of the buildings, after 9-11, many buildings had the ugly security stanchions. They still have stanchions not permitting you to go up to the higher floors. And there are some buildings, including, for instance, the Woolworth, which has a sign outside which says, visitors not permitted beyond this point. Um, this is one of the problems. It's protected, the interior is beautiful, but you can't go in to see it. And let me, uh, let me just interject about the Chrysler Building, because one of the things that I found fascinating that I didn't know um, the Chrysler Building, I think as you saw on one of the slides, was designated as an interior landmark in 1978. And so oh. the Landmarks Commission had jurisdiction and, and could regulate changes to it. Um, one of the owners, I think it was the Metropolitan Life Company, uh, who was investing a lot of money in the building and trying to bring it back <coughs> up into you know, sort of Class A office space, um, they hired an interior designer who put together a proposal to the Landmarks Commission to radically alter the interior, so change the, the lighting, um, add to that, you know, sort of uh, mess around with that amazing marquetry on the elevators, um, do other types of signage, uh, potted plants, you know, things like that. This, this very like late 1970s Decorated. idea of what a, a Class A office lobby should be like. The Lammers Commission, to their <coughs> credit, uh, pushed back, and so that project never went forward. But just to think, that that would have been, and, and you know, here's MetLife, a very powerful property owner, putting a lot of pressure on the Landmarks Commission to say yes and say, if you don't approve this, this building <coughs> and all the investment that we've made is going to be for naught because nobody's going to want to have their office in here with this lobby. In fact, the interior designer said that it looked like Frankenstein's castle. <laughs> so, you know, everything is relative. This is before, you know, before the sort of intense wave of interest in Art Deco, so kind of put it in the historical context, but I just found that absolutely fascinating. Well, there's another thing about this building. It was not admired when it was built. It was thought much too kishy, kitschy. It was compared with the Empire State, which went up, you know, six months later and was taller in the bargain. Uh, this was really trashed by the press and by the architectural community. But the general public loved it. So, I mean, it, nothing would have happened to it anyway, but the public loved it, which is one of the reasons it succeeded as an office building. One of the th issues that keeps coming up, and Kate reminded me, the Landmarks Commission is 11 people appointed. There are specifications as to the expertise, but it doesn't cover everyone. So there must be an architect, there must be a landscape designer, there must be a representative of real estate. There has only been one interior designer on the Landmarks Commission in the entire history of the commission. Now that's a very sensitive point as far as we're concerned. Uh, there should be people who are more knowledgeable, it's just a bunch of people voting. A hearing on changes, potential changes in a building or an interior, uh, they vote. They have the right to permit the changes. Mm -hmm. And this has caused some of the most egregious changes, um, one of which we're gonna talk about, um, but also you know, some very good ones. 
Okay, let's go on. Radio City <coughs> Musical, in this location, um, do we have a pointer here? No. Okay. I X marks the spot in the middle of Rock Rockefeller Center. This is originally the the attraction was supposed to be the new Metropolitan Opera since we talked about the loss of the old one. But uh, his advisors convinced John Rockefeller Jr. that the opera wouldn't draw enough people to attract to all the retail and offices they <coughs> wanted, but they needed an entertainment like this. And from the very beginning, um, it was an extraordinary example of what we now know as Art Deco style, then the modern style, done the interior by Donald Desky, who was then a young and not very well-known designer. So this was a big coup for him. He inherited the Ezra Rinta mural, which he hated, which was the fountain of youth and has no relevance to entertainment. Uh, but it was a grand space very elaborately done and expensively done with art, like this is Reddy Chamberlain did the doors that lead into the main auditorium. <coughs> and here's the money shot. This, uh, the colors changed. This is an old postcard. The colors changed according to the sound in a specially designed organ. So this was programmed so that you have the colors coming from the seven concentric circles that form the arch. If you will notice, and we don't think about it maybe, but for those of you who've been here, there are no columns. So every, every seat has a good view. There was, this was the largest interior theater of its kind, enclosed interior theater in the world, and I believe it still is. And it, although it was never economically, never financially successful, it went through several changes, but Maybe Kate wants to talk about what was supposed to happen before. I'll tell you how it was preserved. Well, um, it's a, uh, you know how I called the old Met the, the okay. picture. <laughs> what? Oh. Um, you know how I called the old Met the uh, Penn Station of interiors? I think of this Radio City as the Grand Central of interiors because here was a case where it was an interior, well, actually, it, it, the, the law allowed for the designation of interiors. Uh, it was 1978, uh, Rockefeller Center announced plans to close Radio City. They were looking at proposals. They were thinking about actually filling in the theater and building on top of it. Um, so it was total transformation and uh, it was not yet protected. The Landmarks Commission, despite some internal sort of um, conflict about whether they actually had the authority to preserve uh, a theater when it was planned to be you know, changed, the use was planned to be changed, um, they went in and they, and they designated it. So they went to the map and decided that, you know, if we can't preserve uh, an interior like this, then what do we have the law for? And it was the same with Grand Central. The commission really uh, went to the floor to say, we're going to preserve Grand Central at all costs. And actually, almost simultaneously with the designation of Radio City, the U.S. Supreme Court came down with its decision that saved Grand Central Terminal and um, upheld the Landmarks Commission's authority to designate landmarks. So uh, despite some sword rattling, Rockefeller Center <coughs> didn't follow through with a lawsuit as it threatened to do uh, to, um, to uh, challenge this designation. They changed management. Plans but at, and, and the Rockettes, you didn't mention. Oh yeah, the Rockettes had a kick line of the step on the steps of City Hall, right? As so, part of the protest to make people aware right, of the importance. So, I mean, there was huge public outcry. Um, some of you may also remember when uh, the Broadway theaters uh, started to be demolished to make way for the Marriott Marquis uh, Hotel in Times Square. So it was the same thing. I mean, people really came out of the wood woodwork to support uh, resources like this, and the the Landmarks Commission. Again, to its credit, it could have just said, you know, we're not going to tackle Rockefeller Center. They did, and that's why we have Radio City today. But there were also there were little issues like customarily accessible to the public. You have to pay for a ticket to get in. So that argument came up too. Um, what happened? Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer did a complete restoration of this which involved cleaning up. This is the only place we have come across where the bathrooms are designated. As part of the policy of Rockefeller Center, the entire Rockefeller Center was 
art the use of art throughout all the buildings was mandated and you'll see good art even on the exterior of many of the buildings so this had art works and all of the bathrooms were different um, downstairs we didn't show, show you all of those photos just part of the murals by L Louis Boucher so you have different atmospheres in each part of the theater well what they had to do to restore it oh this is this is what's done here now now I mean among the events now that it's been restored are the NFL draft the Academy Awards were there at least one time and then there are the Rockette performances it has been proven to be able to be a profitable venue in the course of the restoration I'm not showing you those images we had too many images the carpets had to be rewoven. They had to research the original colors. They had to dig down the, uh, in layers of the wall to find out what the original wall covering had been and go through the fading to get the original color and have it rewoven. So that restoring a, an interior is very complex. It's very labor intensive. Uh, it, it can be prohibitively expensive. And so you need an owner who is willing to do this, as opposed to just let it go. Because the landmark <coughs> designation does not insist that you restore it, insists only that you not destroy it. The Empire State Building, which in a very old faded photograph, but we wanted to show you again what it looked like before everything grew up around it. Um, the exterior and the interior were designated together. And this, um, this went under, Carol and we were just talking, uh, Carol's what, your son just moved into offices there. At one point, well, let, let's start, it was beautifully done. Rambush Decorating Company had its uh, chief designer, Leif Nandro, Leif Nandros, did a mural on the ceiling, a stencil mural. In the 70s, this was the way things were modernized. You dropped the ceiling, had a hidden lighting. It had paneling. What were they depicting? Wonders, wonders, of, the wonders of the world. It was the eighth wonder of the world, the Empire Stable. OK, around. So there was rationale for this. This was a really important building. I mean, the president, President Wilson, pressed a button in the White House to turn on the lights. <coughs> you know, this was, I mean, this was a big deal. Uh, people, thousands of people came in to go to the building as well as to go to the observation deck. So it was a prestige place to have offices until it sort of died down. Uh, the restoration by Byron Blinder Bell brought back the ceiling and all of the paneling. One of the things they found was that they couldn't, as I said, they couldn't destroy the ceiling, but it was too fragile to restore. So what they did is they laid canvas on the ceiling and recreated it, copied the design, the stencil design, with, as you see, uh, you know, 50, several months of working on this, multiple people, and they had to also replace the bookmark. Uh, I'm sorry, these just had to be cleaned up. There were <coughs> medallions scattered around for each one of the trades that worked on the building. So there was the designer, I get this is the carpenters and the machine trades. They had the elevators, they had the decorators, the architect, and the model of the building. Now it looks more like this. The second level, they had to create a chandelier because a chandelier on the second level was never built. So the architects found plans in the archive and reproduced something. So the restoration is sometimes a matter of fixing up what is there, if it's still in usable condition, sometimes restoring it or recreating it, and sometimes making something that's compatible because whatever it is was lost. Uh, did we have any big preservation no, I, issues I, here? I think it's just interesting to think about um, these lobbies and how uh, so many of them were you know, bastardized at some point or in you know, some Modern cases lives. totally destroyed. Um, that, that sort of it's come full circle and that you know, restoration and, and uh, bringing them back to their original luster is seen as a good investment. And so there is uh, a huge uh, restoration industry around resources like this. Um, the theaters, which I mentioned before, also the 
you know, whereas the, the theater owners used to say, oh, no, no, if you designate this interior, you know, it'll, we'll never be able to, um, you know, do all the things that we need to do in order to put on these great spectacular theater productions. Um, but uh, the, the truth is that, that theater restoration has become a huge industry in New York City. And um, I think it's the same with these lobbies because they recognize that people come to see these and people want to be in, you know, this, this equals prestige uh, in today's market. But there are also several downtown buildings, including the Woolworth and I think one Wall Street and several, which are being at least partially converted to luxury condos. And they're being marketed as come see our landmark lobby. This would not have happened 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, because then it would have been, modernizing would have been a different thing. Um, well, the Woolworth building, mentioning that, what they are having there is there is going to be a separate entrance. The top, I think it's the top 30 odd floors are going to be condo. The rest of it is office building. The lobby is maintained, has been maintained as it was, and the condo owners are going to have a separate entrance. So that will be an entrance that was not building a new entrance. It's an entrance that was pr uh, previously a service entrance. So they're keeping them separate. They're not destroying the space. <clears throat> and this, is, uh, this was interesting because there was a very important major tenant, a bank. So they needed this to be a lobby entrance for the bank as well as for the people, for the Woolworth Company. And what was designed was this grand staircase that went up to the mezzanine level for the bank, which has long since moved out. Now the, uh, <coughs> the uh, I'm not sure whether the uh, desk was there originally, but these are the people who stop you if you manage to open the door and go in mm -hmm. and aren't entitled to be there. Um, but this kind of the beautiful ceiling, all of this, now this didn't need total restoration. This was kept up along the way by sympathetic owners who are not Woolworth anymore. But you see, the, there was a time in this era, uh, ceilings tended to be mosaic and arched. A lot of them looked like the sky. This isn't quite the sky. But you have beautiful spaces like this that when there's a period in which these aren't appreciated, it becomes more vital to have them protected by landmark designation. And this one, I don't think this was a preservation issue. No, I, I think just to the point about um, accessibility to the public, um, it is difficult to get access to this interior just walking off the street. I mean, you can go on a guided tour. I mean, I think it's as frustrating as it is to not have these public assets, assets um, truly publicly accessible. Uh, it's still, I think, in our interest to keep the definition of publicly accessible as broad as possible so mm -hmm. that it includes uh, lobbies like this. Um, another example of, a, of an interior landmark that is mostly off limits to the public, of course, is the old City Hall station of the original IRT subway, which some of you may have been on tours of that, but obviously yeah. you can't just go there anytime you want. But we're lucky that it's preserved. That is perfect. And that one's a security issue. This, I must tell you, um, you can sort of, this is not efficient, you can talk your way into the Woolworth lobby. I mean, you can open the door, it's not locked. I went in and, told, you know, I'm really an architecture fan, I'm a design historian. They don't let you walk all over, but they don't, you know, they don't come and forcibly take you out. So that's, but, but you can't tell them I told you that. Um, but this kind of space is something, you know, they don't make things like this anymore. There aren't people who are willing to spend the money to make things like Wait, this. You don't get to see the top part where those glass what? panels are. Oh, no. You don't see that. No, yeah. you can't see. You have right. to get well inside. But this is one of the models. This one is the architect with holding the model. There are, there are several. There's the architect, the banker, the owner of the building, these, I don't know, sort of gargoyle type figures scattered around. And you can't see them very clearly if you don't know what they are and look for them. Um, the next one, okay, in Rockefeller Center, the RCA building was the linchpin of it. It was the largest, at two million square feet, it was the largest office building of its time when it was built. And this was, it was, you couldn't, they couldn't afford to build this as a spec building. They had to find a tenant. 
for the largest building there. And at that time, radio was new. And the network of radio stations across the country under the RCA Corporation was, it was appropriate to sell this as a, lab, as a building to make a statement for the corporation. And um, it started out with big RCA <coughs> letters across the front of it. And then they became an NBC letters, and now it is Comcast. But the building itself was maintained all along. And the interior of it included, again, I told you about the art mandate. And this is a relatively small lobby. So when you come in, the main feature here is the Jose Maria Serps. Uh, oh, let's see, this one is American Progress. And the other one along the wall is Time. And uh, <coughs> some of you may know the story. The other, the other uh, designers commissioned to do murals were Frank Brangwin and Diego Rivera. Does anybody know the Diego Rivera story? OK. For the, couple, for the two people who may not know it, he had, um, he had Lenin's picture in the mural. <laughs> and he refused to take it away. And so Rockefeller <laughs> had the mural covered up. And, we played, and you could see the mural, now wait a minute, um, MoMA had an exhibit last year, it's yeah. not up, on Diego Rivera when they, they had an image of the mural. But they replaced it by another Jose Maria Serrat mural. But throughout the space, the designation here of the um, wayfinding is with brass strips inserted in the uh, terrazzo flooring. Uh, there's a mezzanine level. This is a very beautiful space to walk through. And mm -hmm. just some of the, I mean, this is looking very <laughs> 30s, you know, the triumph of man. Um, it's in the same general aesthetic as the Paul Manship sculpture of Prometheus over the uh, skating rink. And here's, you see, the side, uh, re really rather narrow hallways. But because it's so tall and because of the mural's three dimension, you get an effect of spaciousness. OK, the rainbow room. Again, this one's sort of out of order of when it was designated. But in terms of being in the same location, uh, <coughs> how, many of you, how many of you are from New York? OK, how many of you went to the rainbow room? a long time ago, oh, yeah. when it was really the old rainbow room. Um, this was a romantic place to go for special <laughs> occasions. You know, I mean, for dates or romantic things or to mark birthdays or anniversaries. It was a place in which part of the decor, the most important part of the decor, was the windows. Because the landscape, not the landscape, the views of the city were really what the interior was designed to show off. So you had the tall floor-to-ceiling windows. You had a rotating dance floor, which went, what it was, took about, about five minutes to go around. So it wasn't, you know, um, didn't make anybody dizzy. Uh, you had levels. You had a recessed ceiling, a beautiful crystal chandelier. Um, this was redone fairly authentically by Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer in the, I think it was 87 or 88. But, um, Nobody goes out formal dancing and dining anymore. And this, after a while, was not successful. Even despite the views, there were other places to go see views. So it went through several changes. Uh, changes of ownership, nothing really worked. Um, the most recent one is, well, it was Cipriani for a while. It was closed for a while. And it was a private club, so it's gone back and forth. Now it's been redone, and one of the problems that we have with it, it's lovely, but it's not quite the same. And this brings up the limitations of landmark designation, which is the landmark interior designates things that are attached. So that doesn't deal with the furniture. It doesn't deal with the color scheme. So what happens here is they have, this is the same chandelier. I mean, it's a newer shot, so it looks cleaner. The floor has been restored. It's not 100% the same. They've approximated the same interior, the, the same design. But it was landmarked along the way. And this is the technical issue, or the, the regulation issue. It was landmarked, it was changed along the way. 
So the question was, well, are we preserving the original or are we preserving the 1987 restoration? So that, you know, the Landmarks Preservation uh, Commission has to deal with what they will permit. What I object to that they permit <coughs> now is that there are like crystal beads at the window. So you can see out, but you can't see out the way you used to be able to see out. And they have changed the approach which was not part of the landmark designation. So, you know, this is the question. It's been preserved, but it's been preserved kind of a little bit differently. These are some of the issues that may come up with the uh, change of use at the Four Seasons restaurant, which is also an interior landmark, but as we know, the Four Seasons is not going to be the Four Seasons for much longer. So once it's no longer a restaurant, uh, we hear that it is supposed to continue to be used as a restaurant, but a restaurant with a totally different theme, different decor. Um, so how that will fit into the actual landmark portion of the Four Seasons is a question that the Landmarks Commission will have to grapple with. But I am, um, I well remember a conversation that I had with, um, in about 2011, with the former president of Lincoln Center, because Lincoln Center is a, a place that Landmark West has been trying to get designated as landmark both outside and in for many years, and uh, Lincoln Center has always been opposed to designation. Um, so when I was talking to him about this, he raised the Rainbow Room as, well, look at the Rainbow Room. I mean, it, nobody knows what to do with it, and it's because it's a landmark. He said, actually, it's not a landmark. This was 2011. This was before it was designated. So the landmark designation had nothing to do with the perceived functional obsolescence of this room. So I think that that's something that, you know, we assume places like this are landmarks. They're not necessarily landmarks. And um, there are lots of examples of places that have continued to be in vibrant um, just, yeah. Yeah. The, the, in, in the balance four, of the landmark designation. The Four Seasons issue, incidentally, they there's a limit to what they can change. They cannot change the pool. They cannot change the, um, the uh, aluminum uh, bead curtains. Mm -hmm. And they cannot change, for those of you who know it, the Richard Lippold sculpture that's a very important architectural element over the bar. But they can take all the furniture out and put different furniture and flowers. It, it may still look beautiful, but it will be a totally different interior. And of course, they've, originally, they've already taken out the Picasso curtain, which at the, at the entry, because that was not part of the landmark designation. So landmarking does not protect everything. Um, sometimes everything works fine. The French building was the tallest building on Fifth Avenue when it was built. And it is still, it remained a prestige location because it's a, spectacularly beautiful building. It's, um, this entrance was supposedly, I never knew that originally looking at it, this was inspired by the Ishtar Gate. I'm not sure. I mean, well, the shape of it. The decor is a combination of Islamic and Art Deco and Turkish and Middle Eastern, that Turkish too. Um, it's a combination of things, brilliant <coughs> colors. It's been beautifully maintained all along. Fred French was very proud of the building and spent a lot of money to build it. And, you know, the people who have offices there still admire it and haven't moved out, even though the neighborhood in the, what, 40s and Fifth Avenue is not quite as fashionable as it was then. And I don't think this, this wasn't an issue with preservationists. This was a building that was clearly meriting designation. And just some of the details here in the elevators, too. Uh, the two lobbies, one on 45th Street, one on 5th Avenue, are different. I mean, complementary colors, but the decor is different. The only thing that's changed is there are, there's a glass uh, vestibule put inside the main doors. But that's, you know, permissible, and that's a weather-resistant resist, uh, thing. <coughs> Okay, the Williamsburg Savings Bank. This is time to talk about the changes in use. How many of you have gone into a banking floor recently? That's unusual. How many of you go to the ATMs? 
I mean, that's how most of us get our money. So that <coughs> large banking floor is an extravagance for a bank. So that, plus the fact that we have seen many, many bank mergers, just like mergers of other corporations, has led to the fact that there are a lot of useless bank buildings around the city. And while, for those of you who live in Manhattan, three or four of them have been converted to Cipriani's, they are most of them, but the thing is that's all right. It's an event space, but it's preserved. They're generally not adaptable to many other uses. And this is just one of them. I'm showing you one of the two Williamsburg banks we have in the book. The other one is a classical building, which is now up for sale. Um, this looks like a cathedral, which is what it was intended to look like. And the Landmarks Commission referred to it as honoring the religious act of depositing money. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there is God. <laughs> and even even the check writing tables were works of art. With you know, by um, I can't remember who who did this, but by uh, an artist, an important artist. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Samuel Yellen, who taught at the New York School of Interior Design. And here, where there would normally be the, um, the priest would stand, this is a mosaic which depicts an aerial view of Brooklyn with the bank at its center. So it's a little <laughs> bit distorted. And <clears throat> ceiling with stars on the ceiling. And there were figures which were, there was symbolism like there would have been in a cathedral, but these were symbols of thrift and commerce and worthy things like that not religious figures. And these are around the bank. So for a while, after the bank manufacturers moved out, um, it became the Brooklyn Flea for a couple of years. And then most recently, it was One Hansen. This is located right <coughs> just a block away from the Barclay Center. And One Hansen just gave up the lease. And uh, at one end, of one side of the building, a pretty much dent dentist's office, one Hansen was the party operator. It will probably be another lessee of something of that sort. So as with the Cipriani spaces, which I found you can talk your way into if they've got an event going on that evening and they set it up and you ask nicely. They'll let you walk in and look at the space. But technically, this isn't open to the public if you're not invited to a party. But it's a choice of having this or having it torn down. You're not going to make this into a retail store or a library or somebody's offices. Um, I think all of us, certainly people who are interested in the Skyscraper Museum know this, which is our best international style building. And you see here at the entrance the reflection of the New York Yacht Club on the other side. And it sort of echoes the three-part classical entrance. Um, the interior is very spare. And this was, the building was influenced, I'm sorry, these are bad shots because we couldn't get the original shots from the photographer in time. Uh, it's all travertine. It's pure reflecting the exterior. And as happens with a very modern building, and we talk about this as a problem, the exterior and the interior are integral. You can't be changing the interior without it being seen on the exterior. So there's almost no meaning to designating the exterior without taking into account what's inside. Uh, the present owner, I don't think it's there anymore, the present owner is an art collector of art that doesn't necessarily go with this building. He put a big Jeff Koons sculpture in the middle of it at one point. And this is the man who has not been willing to negotiate with the Four Seasons operators, which is why the Four Seasons is moving out next year. Um, this was probably not a preservation issue because it was such an important building. The issue was that um, when the <coughs> Bronfman family, uh, they, I mean, yeah, you know the whole story of the development oh. of the Seagram building and how um, Philip Lambert, the daughter, uh, was very involved in getting these Van der Rohe and Philip Johnson involved with the design, and so um, they were—they felt very possessive over the sort of the.
legacy of this building. And so it was part of the terms of the transaction when, when it was sold to uh, landmark the exterior and the interior of the Seagram building as soon as it was eligible, so in 1989. <coughs> and, um, but that didn't include the Four Seasons restaurant. So it was the owners of the Four Seasons restaurant who tried to get the, the uh, designation of the restaurant included as part of the designation. Because actually, they're lessees. They own the restaurant, but they only lease the right. space. So that was the controversial part, and they succeeded in getting um, it to be designated. Uh, but the owners of the, the new owners of the building, TIAA, TIAA CREP, challenged the designation of the Four Seasons, although they were uh, bound to accept the uh, designation of the Seagram building exterior and lobby. Now, in this case, the, uh, the operators of the restaurant, um, this was self-interest. Just so you know, there were a lot of things going on in these designations. If they got the restaurant designated, it would be hard for anybody to push them out. They, they, so they were protecting their own business interests. Um, they, there was a limit to how much they were willing to pay for it, however. Um, OK. We want to show you something that could have been. We only have one more after this. This could have been a skyscraper, which is why we're including this. The Ford Foundation had the right to build a much taller building and to make money on it from the rent. They decided instead, partly because the operator, the president of the foundation, which was at the time the richest foundation in the country, now it's only one of the richest, um, he admired Mies van der Rohe, had seen his work at Illinois Institute of Technology, wanted a building that good. And the firm that he picked, uh, Kevin Roche, John Ginkelow, is the inheritor firm, the successor firm to uh, Eero Saradens. And uh, they decided to have a building that was only big enough for their needs, with an interior. This is the first of the atriums. We were talking about atriums before. This is also the youngest designated interior. So look at this, this is 1997. The, a lot of building, I mean, 1997, 1967 is the date I wanted you to look at. The youngest building, uh, there are a lot more that could have been designated, that could be designated, that we're not looking at. Partly because there is not enough interest in modern architecture. We don't tend to think of modern architecture as forever. forever. If I say the word landmark, you think of old building. Mm -hmm. You don't think of something new as a landmark. So this, however, is a landscape inside. Where is it located? It's all the way east on 42nd Street. And what avenue? And First Avenue. Oh. And it's, um, you can see <coughs> the interior from the outside. And so it's giving pleasure to the people walking by on 42nd Street, and it's giving pleasure to the people in the office who are looking down on it. Um, there were some problems. Kate was talking about the fact that the landscape, what Richard Kiley's <coughs> landscape yeah. design, yeah. was changed along the way because some of the plants didn't survive. So that's, you know, that's something that has been a challenge. Um, but this is a beautiful space, which has been maintained by the Ford Foundation. They care about it. The last thing is one that is not a, is not anywhere near a skyscraper. Well, at least one person is not. Who, who knows this space? Okay, this is on the west side of Fifth Avenue between 44th and, wait, 44th and 45th, 43rd and 44th Street. This, 45th and 6th, okay, 43rd. Um, at a time when all banks were, as I have said, were places, most of them <coughs> classical, which were safe to either a cathedral or something like a Supreme Court or the White House, something that looked like a massive structure in which your money would be safe. This bank wanted to show that they were open. They were friendly. All their transactions were open to the public, except... <laughs> this is very safe. <laughs> Open to the public, we've got this enormous, enormous vault by stainless steel vault by Donald Desky, who had done the interior of Radio City Musical. 
and the vault is right here in the window as you walk by on Fifth Avenue. The rest of it is glass. It has the largest panes of glass that had been made up until that time, over nine feet high. And the entrance is on the side, so it doesn't break up the space. The horizontal space is broken up by one thing. These are stainless steel escalators designed by Eleanor LeMaire. I'm giving you the name because she was an interior designer. So what happened? Bank mergers, manufacturers, it had been bastardized a little bit, manufacturers trust moved out. And well, then ended up Chemical Bank. Chemical moved out. And Vornado, which owned the building, despite the fact that manufacturers had told the architects that they wanted the building to be suitable for another use in case they ever moved out. Vornado decided it wasn't suitable for another use, hired Skid Morrowings and Merrill to break it up into two, two spaces, which the Landmarks Commission permitted. And they permitted the rotation of the elevator. The, I'm sorry, the escalators. They had first permitted the Harry Bertoia wall to be taken out. Then they went to court and went back in. But here's what happened. The other, there were two entrances now on Fifth Avenue where there had been no entrances. Obviously, when you have an entrance, you walk in the door to a store, you want to be able to go up, up in the escalator. So the commission permitted the escalators to be rotated, which changes the nature of the space. Now, it's a good-looking retail store, two retail stores. And the vault is now a display area backdrop for the Vatican's, which bothers me a great deal. Um, so what you have, I'm sorry, I didn't, it's only, I didn't have, I'm sorry, I didn't have the last shot in there. It is now a Joe Fresh store and an Ill to Harry store. And the sad thing about that is Joe Fresh is moving out because they are closing several of their stores in New York, apparently overexpanding. So after all of this, it's not going to be the same. Um, and to Judith's point, just about the exterior and the interior with these modern <coughs> buildings, uh, you know, with the manufacturer's test company building, it was this seamless integration of, of interior and exterior. But although the exterior was designated in 1997, it wasn't until 2011 that the interior was designated. And that was, um, there was actually a pre-negotiated deal between Vornado and the Landmarks Commission that the, um, the owner who opposed interior designation, because they thought it would interfere with the use of the interior, um, agreed to let it be designated uh, as long as the Landmarks Commission would let them make certain changes to it. So that was the subject of litigation that actually preservationists brought against the Landmarks Commission to say that you know, they, they had not fulfilled their mandate in preserving this interior. In an interior where every line matters to allow those kind of radical uh, changes just seemed to defeat the whole purpose of, of designating the interior. So um, it was through a settlement that the Bertoia sculptures were brought back and, um, and now we so the future remains to be seen. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the, the damage has been done, and perhaps a future owner will restore it to its original. And as we said, it's not that it's ugly. It's that <coughs> it's something other than what the architects had originally designed. And our last, perhaps, what we want to say to you people, as an audience interested in skyscrapers, and most skyscrapers or, or recent ones being modern buildings, <coughs> is we have discussed the idea that the Landmarks Law is not, and the Landmarks Commission is not really prepared to deal with the challenges of new construction, of modern buildings, because of the exterior and, and interior being integral, because the general public isn't interested enough in modern architecture. Um, we don't know what will happen but we're concerned about some buildings that maybe deserve to be landmarked and are old enough to be landmarked, <coughs> but are not. And then the buildings that aren't going to be around long enough to be landmarked because in our fever to constantly build new, we're going to be having to tear down some old things in order to do it. Just food for thought, I mean, Penn Station, uh, uh, Radio City Music Hall, um, 
the Chrysler building. I mean, how old were they all when they were threatened? I mean, they were at this very okay, vulnerable yeah. age between 30 and 50 years old. And that's when they're eligible to be landmarks, but there isn't quite that sort of um, mass public appeal. And so in the very rare cases like the Ford Foundation or uh, the Seagram Building, where there's you know, an interest in preserving these sort of archetypes, um, in general, we don't have the same level of uh, activism and preservation of uh, buildings of the more recent past. And those are the ones that are often the most vulnerable. And will be. But thank you. Thank you. Surrogate's Court yes. also, the, um, um, the Customs House. We, we were only showing, they, they're in the book. It was just we, we decided that for this location we should deal with skyscrapers. But there are, one of the problems with city-owned buildings is, for instance, City Hall only underwent restoration when a rosette fell down off the ceiling. <laughs> Didn't hit anybody. You know, the, the city doesn't, doesn't have a lot of money. And of the money it has, the first thought isn't to go to preserving the buildings. So that one was urgent. Yes? Um, this is a, a question about the, um, how you monetize design and the commercial value of the design. Um, so in the case of open space, there are a lot of studies that show that properties next to uh, conservation areas Likewise, historic buildings and neighborhoods property values tend to go up. What about interiors? Have there ever been studies to show that, uh, just, let's say, call them distinctive historic interiors have commercial value? Uh, for nothing, nothing yet. Probably, this would only be a guess that this is only interest in interiors is only relatively recent. To my knowledge, there's not a sort of a, a scientific evaluation of that, but certainly anecdotally, um, when um, the current owner of the Empire State Building was talking about why the investment in the major restoration of the lobby talked about the value and the prestige of it, and I think it's a it's a it's a useful argument and it's a it, it can be a very convenient argument for um, owners who want to use it. That to their advantage, but at the same time, those same owners would be, I think, equally um, liable to use the opposite argument if they thought that that the historic features or the landmark designation were somehow standing in the way of something else that they wanted to do. I mean, the, the wave of <coughs> restoration, we saw a lot of it, what Marine Air Terminal has a historic mural that was painted over in the 70s. Everything that we ran into with research that had to be restored, almost all of them, not everything, almost all of them were restoration of things that had been covered up. And then there are destruction like, well, the famous one, Gage and Volner, which is one of only two restaurants landmarked. They couldn't tear it apart, but now it's a something like Sally's, a cheap Address. accessories. Address. Yeah. Well, what they've done is they've put plasterboard on the wall, so you can't see the landmark part. But technically, they haven't destroyed it. But this is modernizing it. It was an Arby's, hmm? an Arby's and then a dress store. Oh, that I didn't know. OK, now I know the dress store. Uh, historic, historic preservation tax credits that are used on some interior. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a way to monetize it. Oh, sorry, you, you were up early. You, you mentioned uh, uh, the public library reading room and Lincoln Center. Uh, what else is on your list? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, you I'll put in a plug for this Thursday. Uh, the Edgar Kaufman yes. conference rooms at the UN, Alvar Alto, designed these fabulous conference rooms that have been on the Lambert Commission's list of uh, 
and uh, they were also on the list of uh, sites over 100 throughout the city that were going to be cut from the list of potential landlords because they were sort of perceived as backlog. And so now the, the Landlords Commission is going through a process to rehear all of these sites. And so the, the Alto rooms are one of the sites that will be heard this Thursday. So that's one that we definitely have our eye on as an interior that should be a landmark. Especially, see, the interiors, well, interiors, in the book, we needed things, or we wanted things that made pretty pictures. But sometimes, they're a matter of historic merit, too. Now, I can't think of an interior offhand, but something like Stonewall is, Stonewall Inn was a very recently designated landmark because of its historic merit. Not because it's beautiful, <laughs> but there are, as I said, I can't think of interiors, but there were, certainly are some. Um, well, Ellis Island, the interior of the main hall, you can't say that's gorgeous. I mean, it photographed well, and we put it in the book. Um, Grand Central Station, OK, the, the ceiling is spectacular since it's been restored. But there are places like that that are important historically. Um, the other thing, I think Black Rock, I think the CBS building should be a landmark. There aren't a, a great many modern ones. Um, you know, the, uh, the UN, UN building, some of those interiors, they are important <coughs> historically. So we have to, we have many reasons for designating. Yes? The, the Scribner building, the Scribner building, has an interior and a very distinctive outer space. Yes. Which is Even the Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue. That's landmark. Yes. It's now a Sephora yes. store. But I Attention to that because I'm forgetting the name of the Austrian designer of the storefront. Later on, he worked at Alfred Calvin. Oh, gee. But you know, I'm talking about the very facade of the storefront is revolutionary. And so that may be a long discussion, but would that be interior or exterior or or landmarkable or not? No, technically, that would be exterior. I think, yeah, that would be part of the exterior. But in fact, that's a good example, though. It's a Sephora. You know, I used to like the Scribner's store when it had books in it. But Sephora didn't ruin it. it it's another use, better than tearing it down. I mean, we all know bookstores are not making money anymore. And, you know, publishers aren't making money since Amazon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. That whole, now that, we, again, that's in the book. It's, the whole thing is landmarked, and that is going to be, that's been restored. The restoration is already getting a little seedy. It's going to be the lobby, the public space of what is going to be a hotel, a boutique luxury hotel with two buildings on either side of it. And that, you know, that is protected. That's something we talked about. Kate mentioned the IRT station. When wide-body jets came in, the, the, the uh, terminal couldn't accommodate them. There's nothing they could do to fix that. But at least, you know, they didn't make it into a retail store. So it's going to be accommodated somehow. And you can go out to see it. Well, it was last open for Open House New York. <laughs> And eventually, you know, in a couple of years, it'll be open to go out to the lobby of the hotel. Just curious about the law itself. Was it modeled after another city? The only, the only city that has a law, law that has standalone landmark preservation ordinance prior to New York was LA. And LA has a very different law. So this law, this law is actually about 50 years in the making and uh, was finally. Um, people think of the station as the catalyst, which it was in public opinion, but it had actually been in the works for many, many decades. It was really the last straw. Yeah. Now, there were, there were earlier laws permitted um, Charleston and New Orleans to be historic districts. Another question, like, how do you count interiors? I mean, for example, it sounds like Rockefeller Center has multiple, like of the 170, it's how many one, different? It's one each one. It's one designation. Yeah. Properly. Yeah. And then why was, <laughs> you know, the, at the Chrysler building, there was a restaurant, I'm saying a club. Yeah, that's oh, gone, yeah. the Cloud Club. That never got designated. 
Yeah, um, in general, private clubs are not so like the university club or you know some of these really wonderful interiors that are privately used and owned, like clubs and residential lobbies are not eligible because. <coughs> Yeah. There's actually a question in the back. So yeah, is. isn't Boston uh, preservation older, the oldest in the country? No, not, not no, yeah. no. But they have a couple, several cities have various forms of designation, de designation, and then local community groups are really what what are important in saving buildings, saving neighborhoods. Uh, there's been a recent. Uh, court case uh, involving uh, an interior that's um, being privatized. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interior and a very important uh, public clock. Um, would you know what the latest Oh, it's the is? clock tower, yeah. The latest I know is that they've been signed to a judge <coughs> and they're waiting to make the argument that the people who are suing the Landmarks Commission uh, the Landmarks Commission uh, issued a permit to allow a developer to privatize this this landmark interior by allowing them to turn it into a condo. So this clock tower and the mechanicals and all of this amazing stuff that people used to be able to go up and tour and uh, was you know there for the public to enjoy. Um, you won't be able to get to. Living or, or something. So, so it's 346 Broadway. No, designation no. is in perpetuity until the Landmarks Commission can de-designate landmarks, which it is de-designated landmarks if they're, say, destroyed by fire or something like that. But um, that's actually the crux of this lawsuit, is people are, are challenging the commission, saying that by issuing this permit and allowing this, um, this you know, privatization of public space, uh, is they in, in essence de-designated the landmark without proper going through the proper procedure. The Landmarks Commission has very broad <coughs> discretion in what it can allow. Um, so, so it's very difficult to challenge a decision on the merits. It's often this type of technicality that uh, one can uh, prevail on. So the issue of de-designation is what they're focusing on with the project. And the, the commission, incidentally, as opposed to having a consistent policy, changes with the new administration. So that's the other issue. Um, thank you very much for coming. I think Here, we've got one candidate. <coughs> Thanks. Welcome. For those of you who are new to the museum, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder and director um, and curator uh, of our exhibitions here at the Skyscraper Museum. And uh, once a month, and uh, sometimes even, even more, we hold programs in the space like this. So if you um, haven't been here before and you haven't had a chance to look around after the talk, feel free to look at this exhibition, which uh, I noticed everybody came up the back staircase, but the way you're supposed to come into the space is up the ramp and circulate through the uh, promenade architecturale in order to see the show which is called Ten Tops. Uh, 100 story buildings and what happens at the, at the top of them. Uh, he, in the programs that we do at the museum, we try to complement uh, the exhibitions, but we're, uh, and we have a, have a series of programs on, by architects talking about their buildings called Skyscraper Seminars, which is focused on some of these buildings. Uh, but on a regular basis, and now for 11 years in this space, we've done book talks once a month on topics of New York City history, urbanism in general, um, skyscrapers, and, uh, and urban history. And this year in particular, we've focused <coughs> on the 50th anniversary of the Landmarks Law. And uh, as some of you know, because you've been here for earlier uh, programs, um, Andrew Dolcart, for example, talked about uh, um, save, saving, why well, I'm saying saving grace, saving place uh, is the name um, of the book, also by Monticelli uh, Press. Um, that's a, a, a companion of the outsides of the book that is about the interiors of landmarks. Um, the 50th anniversary of the Landmarks Law 
does not cover the, lamb, the landmarking of interiors, which began in 1973 1973 only. Um, and the um, precious 117 um, uh, current count of landmarks interiors, um, of a, some third or no, about half of those are documented um, in this really gorgeous book that uh, with texts by Judith Gura and Kate Wood, um, whom I'll introduce in a moment, and by um, the photographer Larry Letterman, who, um, who is, isn't here speaking tonight, but is represented by these absolutely, the gorgeous photography that you'll see here um, in a moment in the lecture. So um, it struck me as I was um, looking again through, through the book today, this is the absolute perfect Christmas gift as a combination <laughs> of not just a great coffee table book for its gorgeous, uh, gorgeous photography, but also a really solid um, academic consideration and documentation of um, these incredible, this incredible um, catalog of, uh, of New York buildings and interiors and the exceptional um, wealth, glamour, brilliance, um, uh, civic, duty and expression that was a part of New York's history, well, from its beginning, but most particularly in these great Beaux-Arts buildings that are documented so beautifully in the book from the 1880s, 90s, and through the um, first decades of the 20th century. And it's that, um, <coughs> that, that rich array, that you know, visual splendor that they're going to show us in the, in the photographs tonight, but also tell us about the history. So um, some of you I know are friends here of Judith Gura and also of Kate. Um, and because they have such um, accomplishments. So Judith is a, uh, on the faculty of the New York School of Interior uh, Design and her previous books are um, quite historical but also mo uh, modernistic guide to period styles for interiors and the history of interior design um, after modernism and New York interior design. So she's, um, she's a, a great, has someone, uh, is someone with great um, flair and, uh, and enthusiasm for the interior design issues. And of course, um, Kate Wood has been a, a fixture in the historic preservation community uh, and activism for historic preservation in New York for many years. She was um, a executive director of Landmarks West. She left for a few years. She's teaching on the faculty of uh, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia. Uh, and she has just recently returned to Landmarks uh, West where she's the new president. So we're very pleased to be able to uh, have them share with us their, their knowledge and their enthusiasm tonight. Thank you. 